Hello, and welcome to Memory Card. My name is Ben Bertoli. And my name is Push Dustin. And we are here to illuminate some weird and wonderful gaming history. Every episode, one of us will take on the role of the expert and describe the story behind an interesting character, game, console, or accessory. And there may be some episodes where we're both the expert, or a guest expert stops by. This podcast is a bit of an experiment, so we're just going to have fun with it. Time to boot up episode three. So this is going to be our very first episode where we are both the experts. So we're going to go back and forth. We're going to talk about weird controllers today. So we each have three controllers that we picked that we thought were kind of strange. Give a little bit of a backstory, and then we'll kind of decide, you know, which one's the weirdest. Okay, so my first controller is kind of like a console as well. Okay. It's, it's a weird uh, combination of things, and it's called the Terebiko or, or something to that regard. It's T-E-R-E-B-I-K-K-O which, you know, I'm not the best at Japanese, and you are, but... Yeah, I haven't seen the um, the the Japanese characters for the name, so I'm not exactly sure, but it, based on the way that's written out in Romaji, it seems like it would be uh, Terebiko. Right, like kind of like television, kind of, a little bit? Yeah, I'm guessing the uh, Terebi is uh, television. So the uh, Terebiko is, is basically like an interactive VHS console game system that was launched by bandai in 1988 so it's pretty old what would happen is you would plug this thing into your vcr or straight into your television and i'm honestly not sure how it works Uh, i even looked into it and i couldn't quite figure it out but basically you interact with these special vhs tapes that would come Mm -hmm. with this system slash (laughs) controller and uh, to picture the controller it's basically a old telephone with a cord and, you know, it ha- actually has, like, a normal, like, phone receiver that you can pick up and talk into. Mm-hmm. And then it has four very large buttons that are numbered one to four and have the colors red, green, blue, and yellow. And it's got, like, an audio out thing. Okay. So what would happen is you would watch the VHS. In the VHS, there's, like, Super Mario World mm-hmm. and Dragon Ball Z and Hello Kitty and Sailor Moon. And things would happen. And then the people in the show would call you in your living room in these different shows and, you know, like games. Goku goes and picks up uh, <laughs> Terabiko, like in his, you know, in the show and like picks up. He's like, hey, are you there? Like, I need your help. It's just very strange. Mm. So they would either ask you what to do to move the plot forward or they would uh, like ask you trivia. OK. Can you name all of Hello Kitty's friends type of thing? And you'd have to pick like oh, red, green, blue, yellow. It's basically a phone that has giant buttons. For 1988, it seems pretty, mm. you know, ahead of its time. The way that you described it, it seems like it's like one of those um those DVD games that they had, like on the Shrek DVD, for example, where you like get asked questions and you could like use the uh, DVD remote to like answer it. It seems like a primitive version of that. Yeah, it kind of is. I guess it's kind of the the original version of that. Although I'm still not sure how exactly it works through like a normal like cable hookup. I would imagine it has, maybe it's a special TV. No, see, that's the thing is like the device is the phone itself and you have to plug it into your normal, I assume, VCR. I don't know. Maybe this is a mystery that's worth an entire episode later. <laughs> 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 All right. So Terabiko, uh, uh, out of 10, as far as uh, weird and cool, how many points do you give it? For weird, I would say it's probably like a six. For cool, I would say probably seven. Really? I thought cool was going to go way low. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm just really interested in like really ob- obscure things. So. All right, fair enough, fair enough. All right, you're up. Next controller. The first controller that I'm going to be talking about today is a game that was uh released exclusively in Japan and it's called Henro-san Hoshi no Dojo. It's based off of this thing called the Shikoku Pilgrimage, which I'm assuming that you've never heard of, right? I have not. No, please enlighten me. Okay. Shikoku is one of the main islands of Japan. It's the um the smallest one it's it's a little bit to the south and east Mm -hmm. of the main island there is a monk who is named uh kukai and he basically founded all these temples in japan there's uh 88 but there's some also that are not included in this list 
people actually take this pilgrimage of going to all of the temples that the Kukai founded, basically. It's typically completed on foot, but some people have been using, like, cars, taxis, and stuff like that. It's about 1,200 kilometers long, which is like 750 miles. And so it takes people like a month or two months to complete. I'm so interested as to how this ties into a video game controller. <laughs> so, so, you know the company Panasonic, right? Yes. Panasonic, they had this division that was called the PIN change, which was the Panasonic Innovative Navigator Change. Okay. Hmm. So they were founded in like 2002. Two, I believe one of the first products that they released was this uh, Henro um, game for the Nintendo GameCube in 2003 and it came out in three different sets there was one which just included the game then an upgraded version which included a pedometer in the game and then a third version which included the walking pad a pedometer and the game and then because it's Panasonic they also released one with the Panasonic Q which was like the starter set hmm so the whole gameplay is um, you would use the pedometer in your day-to-day -day life, and that would keep track of your steps, and then connect to the GameCube. And oh. that would allow you to um, progress further and further to the different temples. Oh, wow. That's such a weird real-life connection. Yeah, yeah. It's like kind of like a, a pre-Pokemon Go yeah. that's much, much less interesting. <laughs> It's kind of like uh, Pokemon Pikachu, you know, the little, like, pedometer, you know, oh, yeah. Tamagotchi, but then you plugged it in. Yeah. When you, in the game, once you got to a new temple, it would tell you, like, the history of the temple. You could, like, view pictures of it. I th You could pray. I'm not too knowledgeable about the whole um, Buddhist uh, rituals and stuff like that, but from what I understand, they would go through the, the mantras mm -hmm. and stuff like that in the game as well. That's pretty wild. That was the only game that the pin change actually developed but they did make other products they made like a virtual keyboard that connected mm. to a cell phone and it kind of like shined light and people could type on it and then like a cd player they were going to make a sequel to it but then the company shut down in 2005 oh no that'll always stop you from creating a sequel <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I mean that's that's pretty cool it's such a novel idea i feel like i give it more points for weird i give it an eight for weird uh, as far as cool i don't know a six maybe for cool I mean, the, the controller is, is ugly as, as hell. <laughs> like, it's um, the walking pad thing is just really three big buttons that mm. you can use in the game. Weird. That you can stand on. Oh, yeah, that is very strange. Yeah. All right, you ready for my next one? Go ahead. All right, so the year is 1998. Very good, a great year for video games, honestly. Like, one of the best years. Mm -hmm. There's a development company called Paradox Development, and they have made this new fighting game. Um, it's called Thrill Kill. First of all, they made the entire thing. Like, it was ready to go. It was ready to ship out at the end of 1998. But it got canceled because it was so ridiculously violent and mature. It, was, it would have been the first game to get, like, an ESRB rating for uh, adults only, like AO, which very rarely happens for violence. It was going to be the first one to get it for violence. Is this, like, the Mortal Kombat-like game? Yeah. Okay. The the big thing about it, uh, the engine that they built for this game was that you could do four players at once. So it's kind of like it's like you know, it's before Smash Brothers comes out, but it's definitely more of like a you know, uh, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter type game. It's less floaty, more of people like ripping each other's limbs off. Okay. So basically, what happened was they made this game. It was supposed to be like awesome, but just like a little too over the top, like crazy violent. So they canceled the game, and they're like, oh man you know paradox developments like we came up with this great engine like what are we gonna do mm -hmm. and so enter the wu-tang clan famous uh east coast rappers uh rap group that took their name from like the uh the old kung fu movies they used to watch mm -hmm. and and basically they were like hey we want to make a game and the wu-tang clan's like yeah we want to make a video game do you know any of the members of the wu-tang clan no, I do not. <laughs> Push. I'm pushing, putting your, your street cred on the line here. No, so basically they had the nine uh, main members of the uh, Wu-Tang Clan, including like RZA and my favorite, uh, Ghostface Killer, which is just the coolest name ever. Yeah. Basically, they had this you know rap group. They keep the same engine. They got the four-player fighting, and they apparently it had like really good cutscenes. Like the game got... Uh, uh, like pretty good reviews from like IGN and stuff. It got like eight out of ten and that kind of thing. But basically, it's set in China. 
and there's some uh, evil monk who wants to take over the world, and of course, you know, the Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang Clan has to uh, show up and uh, whoop some butt. Yeah. When they release the game, which is called Wu-Tang Shaolin Style, they release mm-hmm. it with a special edition that comes with a controller, and if you've never seen the logo for the Wu-Tang Clan, it's this big, like, swooping W, and so the controller is a giant W. It's called the W controller. It has all the buttons that a normal PlayStation controller would have, but it doesn't have any analog sticks. Mm-hmm. This is after the DualShock analog stick is kind of like the norm. It's like a step back. Yeah. Basically, it's like an ornamental thing. You know, it's more yeah. of a collector's item. Like, would you want to use it with the game that it came with? No, you wouldn't because it's <laughs> not ideal, but it just looks super goofy. I mean, you know, a W, if you're going to make a controller out of a letter, it's not the worst one, obviously. Mm-hmm. but. It is a very unique and weird controller. Did the game actually have 3D movement, or was it all just 2D? Uh, it had 3D movement, yeah. You could actually kind of like roll around each other. I was watching some gameplay of it, and it's, it's a little confusing because you, there's all these different planes of like action, and it's, it's kind of hard to jump back into the right one to punch and kick the person you want to. So, Okay. All right, so what's your rating for Wu-Tang Clan W controller? For cool, it would obviously be 12. All right, yeah, 12 out of 10, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The other rating was uniqueness. Yeah, I think, like, weirdness. Yeah, yeah, it's not that weird. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the chainsaw controller. Mm. Just, like, a forced, like, um, tie-in it, into a game just to, like, sell more merchandise. All right, what's your number two? Okay, my number two is the biosensor for the N64. All right. This was another thing that was only Japan. It was packaged with Tetra 64. Really? Of all the games? Yes. So Tetris 64 is actually one of four Tetris games for the Nintendo 64, with the other three being Tetrisphere, Magical Tetris Challenge, and the new Tetris. This was actually produced by the Seta Corporation, and they're a Japanese gaming company that did a couple of games for like the NES and Super Nintendo and stuff like that. I think Tetris 64 was their only Tetris game that they made, actually. Gotcha. In order to kind of make this uh, appealing, they decided to include this biosensor. The biosensor would actually connect into the bottom of the N64 control, uh, controller. Like the rumble pack? Yeah, yeah, that um, controller pack expansion. Uh, the clip would go onto your ear. Oh, really? Your ear? Yeah, and that would um, measure your heart rate. <laughs> Why? Would, it, would the game slow down when your heart rate got high, or would it speed up? It, it would speed up. Oh my god, that's terrible. You you could um reverse it so it does slow down, but de oh, facto okay. it, it um or the normal mode it increases the difficulty as the heart rate goes up. Wow. So if you're good at like keeping your cool, then the game's just gonna be easy all the time. I was watching a review by my friends over at the Famicast and they mm. um compared the reading with their their Apple Watch and it was pretty accurate, they found. So could this controller be used for any other game? It's just the one game. Just one game. And um, the way that it would increase the difficulty is by giving you different pieces. So they have the, the, normal, um, the normal pieces, but then they also have the A group and the B group. And the A group are, are generally easier pieces. Like they have a, one that's just one block. <laughs> Whereas like the B group is you know made out of like six or seven blocks. So in this mode... It would give you different blocks, and it would change the speed, potentially? Uh, just to give you different blocks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. The speed would increase um, as you play the game, just normally. Oh, just, just normal style? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's weird. I, I give that one a, a 10 out of 10 for weird. It's impressive that they got it to work so well, I will say that. Cool factor, I don't know. I feel like if someone walked in on you playing that... They, they beat you up on the spot. <laughs> mom, it's not what it looks like. <laughs> even you, Yeah, even your own mom. You know that people were like clamping it to different parts of their bodies just, just to see if it could like pick up their heart rate. Like, hey, I'm going to put it on my tongue. I'm going to put it on my nose. Yeah, my nipple. Yeah, my yeah. toe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to my third controller here. And this one of the three that I've done is probably the one that people might know the most. Moving on from uh, 1998 and the, the ruckus of the Wu-Tang Clan into 2001, 
Sega has just announced that basically the Dreamcast is dead, unfortunately, and that they're going to move on to just, you know, publish games for other consoles. Mm -hmm. So in May of that same year, 2001, Sega announced there's going to be a GameCube port of the very popular Fantasy Star Online game. And uh, they chose the GameCube because apparently they have like it's a similar kind of like build to the dreamcast and it also supports dial up yeah uh internet even though it can't do that right out of the box which is something that nintendo knows and at this point they have not even released anything that lets it play online it's actually kind of because mm. of this announcement that nintendo's like okay we need to develop a modem <laughs> yeah like a broadband adapter we can plug into the bottom they get to work on you know porting over fantasy star online and they come out with uh, basically what they call like episode one and episode two. You had to pay a monthly subscription to play the games, mm -hmm. which is like very novel idea back in the GameCube era, like for a console game, you know, especially a Nintendo console game. Along with this, because in Fantasy Star Online, there's a lot of like online communication, but there's no voice chat. They decide to come out with a keyboard for the GameCube that is positioned between. Mm -hmm. the it's like if you took a gamecube controller and you like cut it down the middle and then like pulled it apart and just put a <laughs> normal keyboard in between that's what this controller looks like but it is like a full controller that you can hold on either side it's a very bizarre looking thing it's like a, a very long controller when i was in japan recently as you know i saw one for sale and i think it was like 80 90 bucks i almost bought it but mm -hmm. yeah i mean they're i think they're like kind of rare obviously less so in japan i know a lot of people like like to import them out but yeah so that came out for fantasy star online episode one and two and uh like most of the controllers we've been talking about didn't really have any good use for another game because you didn't have to type anything uh out to uh, other players online although i'm not sure like if you were like inputting your name for a file on a normal, you know, like Legend of Zelda Wind Waker or something, if you could use it to type it in, I, I don't think you I'm could. Not sure if that works. Yeah, I have a feeling that it wouldn't quite line up. Yeah, I think it would only work if um yeah, if it was programmed specifically for that, because it's not like a button right. input, right. it's a letter. But do you know the other games that were that utilized GameCube online? I know that you could connect GameCubes to do like sixteen player Mario Kart, but I know that wasn't online, that was like a LAN thing. But no, I don't think I know most of the ones that could use uh, GameCube Online. It was the um the Fancy Star Online games, and then I uh, Jap Japan only home, uh game called Homeland, which is mm. a role role playing game by uh, Chinsoft. Oh okay, so just those two series. I believe so. All right, so what's your rating for my final controller? Um, I mean, I, I knew about this. I actually have touched one in person. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I regret not buying it. Um, <laughs> I love just the the idea of playing like Smash with a huge game uh, GameCube controller. <laughs> uh -huh. Cool factor, I would say it'd be like an eight, but uniqueness, I would say it's like two. Fair enough. All right, hit me with your last one here. Okay, my last one is um is also not very interested. So sorry, both kind of ended <laughs> on a <laughs> small note, but um this one is the Slime controller, which was uh, released. For three consoles. Oh wow! It was created by Hori. It's uh, officially licensed by Square, and the first release was for the PlayStation Two, mm -hmm. and it was released with um, Dragon Quest Eight. And this is just a controller that's just covered in slime, right? They just no, it is. It, it is um, <laughs> the slime from um, Dragon Quest. Oh, okay. All right. And on the bottom of the slime is a, is a working controller. Okay, so for those few people who don't know what the slime from Dragon Quest looks like, can you describe? It's like it's like a blue blob. It's like it's got like a drop, right? Like a droplet. It's got a little like pointy top and like a goofy face on it. Yeah. It's basically like a round controller, right? Yeah, it's completely round, but I yeah, you have to kind of like rest it in your hands. Like the main purpose was to be like a collector's item that you could like have on display and then also use as a controller. The first version was released for the PS2 and it was released with Dragon Quest 8 and it came with two colors, the blue one and the metal color. The metal one is like a silver, and uh, it was released in 2004, and it would actually have a cord that would connect into it because it was PS2. Right. They updated the idea for PS4 last year, and it connects with Bluetooth, and um, has most of the features of a normal PS4 controller, but it doesn't have like the headphone jack and vibration. 
And then the the most recent one was what? The Switch. It's coming out for the Switch very soon. Oh, right, right, right. I think they announced that around uh, E3 time, right? Yep. Yeah, and a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> and I was thinking, uh, I feel like I've seen this before. Yeah, the Switch version will actually have uh, the gyro sensors built into it. Oh, nice. Yeah, and it will have some sort of connectivity with the upcoming Dragon Quest um, 11s. <laughs> is this a controller that is being released in North America and like outside of Japan? So far, it's only Japan. Okay. But the the PS2 version was released worldwide. So there's there's hope for us yet. Yeah. So what would you rate that one? You know, weirdness. I feel like it is up there. I mean, it's it's a. I guess it's not that weird of a character to choose to make into a controller because it's very simple, mm-hmm. but. Yeah, I don't know. I'd give it an 8 for weird. Coolness? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, yeah. I'd give it like a like a 6. I guess it depends on how cool you think the slime is. He's cute. The cute factor is through the roof, but cool factor, eh, it's, uh, it's no Wu-Tang Clan. That's all from us for now. Thanks for listening. We'd like to give a special shout out to Game Boy Chiptune Master Jamatar, who allowed us to use his track Midori as opening and closing music. You can find out more about his banging beats by searching Jamatar, that's J-A-M-A-T-A-R, on Spotify or visiting Jamatar.com. If you have any feedback on the podcast or want to recommend a topic, feel free to reach out to us via Twitter. Ben can be found at SuperBenTendo, and I can be found at PushDustin. Be on the lookout for our next episode dropping soon.